Hi Dragonflies, welcome back to Dragonfly Spirit Studio. I'm Lynn Bauer. I'm back with another postcard paint-along, but this one's a little different from some of the previous postcard paint-alongs, as you may have guessed from looking at the thumbnails. So have you ever had this experience? You have a really busy week or a really busy day and you would like to be in the studio, but you know you're kind of distracted, maybe a little stressed, tired, and you're afraid that if you go in there and work on something that you've already put a lot of time into, you'll just wreck it. And you don't have the energy to come up with something new and exciting, and so you figure if you go in your studio, all that will happen is you'll waste a bunch of time and materials and you'll just wind up more stressed and more frustrated. Well, this video is for those times. Sometimes I think we all get too fixated on the painting as the product and we forget that the product that was most important to us, the thing that motivate us, motivated us to start painting in the first place, was the product of a saner, calmer, more relaxed self. A self that was enjoying the world in a new way and seeing the world through new eyes. So this postcard paint along, while it does result in a postcard that you could mail to someone, is really more about what can you do in those times to keep your brush moving, to continue to learn, but not put a lot of added stress on yourself. And also maybe not feel like you're just wasting materials. So in this postcard paint along, we're gonna be playful with color and playful with the application of paint so that we can explore different color combinations that we might not use otherwise. We might find some good stuff in there. We can explore different ways to apply paint and not worry about wrecking something that we've already put a lot of time into. And at the same time, we're going to practice a couple of skills that we need no matter what our style of painting is, and that is glazing to adjust colors and a little bit of negative painting, kind of an introduction to reserving whites and lights or showing a light object by showing the dark areas behind it or around it. So let's get started and have some fun with crazy colorful pairs. So let's begin by making what I like to call a splashy start. And what I mean by that is I'm just going to splash a little water on the page, maybe with my brush, maybe flick it on with my fingers, maybe even smear it around with my fingers, maybe a little spray. I just want to make sure I don't get the entire page completely wet, leave a few dry areas. Then I'm going to pick two colors, any two colors, maybe kind of at random, whatever suits my mood today. Turquoise always suits my mood, so I'm going to have a little turquoise. And now I'm going to splash those colors in too, and scribble them in, and drop them in. And the only rules in this phase are I don't want to get um, the paper, I don't want to get my paint too dark because I'm going to be painting over it, and I want to be sure to leave some white, especially through sort of the central areas of the page. So otherwise I'm just scribbling. I can have two colors or if I want to I could add a third color. No more than three at this stage. And I want to let them mingle with each other. I want this all to be fairly light and soft. So that's probably enough for that one. Let's move on and do another one. So you can stay with the same colors or you can change it up a little bit. I think I want to do one that's warm colors now. So I think I'll put a little color out. And I started the first one by splashing water on first, but if you like, you can start by splashing paint on first. Okay, so we need to let these dry. And while these are drying, we'll work on the second part of our project, which is drawing some pairs. So I hope you didn't go run away when I said we were going to draw pairs. I promise you you'll be able to draw these pairs. What I have here is a piece of copy paper or printer paper that I've folded into quarters and the reason that I've done that is if you draw your pairs so that they are a reasonable size on this quarter sheet it will be a reasonable size to transfer to your splashy starts on your postcards. So now, here's how to draw a pair. S simple, simple, simple. All you have to do is have a roundish shape 
and a triangular-ish shape. And then you just kind of round out the edges. So I'm going to round out the edges of my pair, kind of following my triangle and my little roundish shape. And then maybe I'll give it a, a stem. Now this one's pretty symmetrical and kind of standing straight up, so that might not be as interesting as maybe a pair that has some personality. So you can use that same idea and say, well, what if I make my roundish shape not quite so round? I'll make it a little bit lopsided, and I'll have my triangular-ish shape kind of going off to the side. And then when I create my rounded version, I'll let it have a little dip here where the stem is, and maybe it'll kind of go in and out. And you don't have to stress about any single one of these, because you can just draw as many as you like until you get a few that you find appealing. Keep going until you have some pairs that you like. The only thing to um, think about is please do not open it up and draw on the back side because we're going to transfer these drawings so you don't want anything written on the back. So if you want to go on to another page that's fine, but stay on one side of the paper. Alright, my splashy start is dry so it's time to put a pair on there. And I can put my pairs on vertically or I can put them horizontally. They don't have to sit entirely inside the page. So if this pair is too tall to sit completely in here and I want it horizontally, I can just sort of crop in so that I'm not showing the whole bottom of the pair. We do this all the time in photography and then sometimes in painting, especially at the beginning, we forget that that's okay to do. You don't have to show the entire pair for someone to know it's a pair. So let's suppose I am going to do this pair. I'm going to turn it over on the back, and I know you can't see through the paper on the video, but I can see where I've drawn lines. So wherever I have a line here that I'm going to transfer, on the back side, I'm going to scribble with my pencil. So I'm basically making like a crude version of carbon paper. Don't use carbon paper for this. Carb actual real carbon paper has a wax base so it will resist the watercolor and you don't want you don't want that. If you have graphite transfer paper you can use that but this is such a quick method of doing this that you can do anywhere so if you're traveling like I have been you don't have those kinds of supplies you can still quickly transfer this drawing because I have enough graphite on the back that when I trace over these lines I'm going to get and I actually think I'm going to do my pair vertically because I like the way the base sits. So I'm going to put my pair where I want it on my splashy start and then I will simply trace over the lines on this side and the graphite on the other side will be transferred to my watercolor paper. So that's a way to get a drawing on your watercolor paper without erasing and redrawing and erasing and redrawing on the watercolor paper because I do all my scratch work on a separate sheet of paper and then I just transfer it. All right, let's give our pair a tabletop to sit on. So I'm going to just use any old straight edge. I happen to have a popsicle stick and just kind of give myself a little table for my pair to sit on. And then this is a wall behind it, and sometimes there's a, a corner back there or some sort of a change in the background. And just for interest, we're going to add, not straight in the middle, <laughs> that's usually not the best place, but off to one side or the other. And on this pair, I, I feel like maybe having um, this be the spot where perhaps the wall goes around a corner, maybe it's an inside corner, maybe this is an edge and there's a room beyond, it's a doorway or something like that. Um, doesn't really matter, but this is just going to give us a way to break up the background as we're doing our negative painting um, to make it a little bit easier for our first stab at negative painting. So now the name of the game is going to be to show where this pair is by showing the viewer where the edges of the pair are 
without drawing lines around the pair. Now we do have some lines here. Those are our planning marks. We're not going to rely on those in the finished painting. And so if you like, I'm going to leave mine dark so you can see them on the video. But normally what I would do is take a kneaded eraser and lift enough of that graphite that in the end, the pencil line won't really show. All you need is a little ghostly line that allows you to see it and then let that blend into the watercolor. So now what I mean by showing where the edge is, is we're going to look at this pair and say to ourselves, where do I want the light to be coming from? I think I'm going to have the light coming this way on my pair this time. So I'm going to draw a little arrow on the tape just to remind me this is the direction I've decided to have my light. So that means this would be the shadow side of the pair. And I'm going to start somewhere on the shadow side and just show part of this edge from maybe here to here. So I'm going to use my fingers as kind of a boundary and say I'm not going to go farther than that. And the reason is our brains like to just keep following edges. So if you don't tell yourself you're going to stop here, the next thing you know you fill in the entire pair. And there are times to do that, but right now we're going to do something a little different. So I'm only going to work from here to here, and I'm going to show where that edge is by making the inside of the pair darker than what's outside it. And now, if I like, I can just leave that a hard edge. Or I can come in with a damp brush and soften all or part of it. Or I can come in with my finger and smudge it. In the early stages, I think it's nice to have things smudged a little bit, at least in some places. So I'm going to smudge it a little bit. So now you can see that we're starting to see, oh, there's the edge of the pear. I can tell the difference between this and this a little bit now. So now we're going to go work on some other part of the pear. So let's define this edge, but this time we'll define the edge by working on the outside of the edge. So let's see, I think I'm going to make that kind of a yellow color over there. So I'll do my tabletop here. And I'm going to come around, again, trying not to go too much farther than my fingers will span for each place that I'm defining the edge. Not because there's anything magic about my fingers, but just because that will keep me from mindlessly going all the way around. And our brains do want to do that. So it helps me to have something to remind me, don't just mindlessly do the whole thing. All right, let's look for another place to define an edge. Maybe we could define this upper edge by making this wall back here a little bit darker wall. So maybe this is going to be a window or a doorway. So let's see, I think I want a darker orange color here in the background. And if it's more comfortable for your hand, feel free to turn your painting upside down. So I'm going to define the edge from here to here by painting what's outside the edge. And I'm coming around the corner here because it sometimes looks weird to come. It's more comfortable for my hand to stop right here, but sometimes that looks odd to have the place where you change from outside to inside be right at the top of an object. So I'm going to go around the corner. So we're going to define this edge. Now this is still wet, so I'm going to leave a little gap in between my pear and my background where that wet area is. And if it gets in there, that's not a big deal. This is early times yet, <laughs> early stage of the painting. So I'm going to go around the corner. That stem I will probably make darker, so I'll just paint right over it for right now. And then remember, I'm only going about as far as my fingers span, so as soon as I get around the corner, I'm going to stop and just smudge that edge or soften that edge. So as you can see, we're starting to be able to find the pair in this scene, not because we've filled in the whole pair, but because we've shown the viewer where the edges are in different ways in different places. So let's see, 
Let's show where this edge of the pear is. Now the light is coming in this way, so maybe on this side I want to use a very pale color to separate it from the background. And as you do this, so I'll go from here to here. As you do this, there's no wrong way, and we're going to have plenty of opportunities to adjust. So at this stage especially, just look for places where you could show the viewer where the edge is and show it. Now this one's starting to get wet in a lot of places, so it's a little difficult for me to find a place to work that's not going to connect up to an area that's already wet and maybe run into that area. So let's pause for a moment on this one and move on to a different one. All right, so on this one, I decided to put on two pairs, but I went ahead and just traced them without deciding ahead of time which one is in front. When you're tracing, it's hard to tell where the lines connect, so that's fine. Just draw them as you wish. And then after you've drawn them, you can decide, oh, I think I'll have the small pair in front, so I'll erase that line with my kneaded eraser. And then I also made this pair a little too high on the page. The top of the pair is kind of just at the tape, and I know that's going to look strange when it's all done. So instead of that, I'm just going to erase that part and reshape it a little bit lower. And it's a pair, so I can just draw it, and I'll let the stem go off the page. That's fine. I don't mind that. And I want to get my colors wet. These are dry, so I'm going to let my colors start softening up while I make my tabletop. And then where shall I make my dividing line? This almost looks like a window with some leaves vaguely seen outside it. I think I'm going to actually make it be a window. I'll put the edge of the window here. Maybe I'll even make like a window sill, or not a sill, but the, whatever you call it, the molding around the window. <laughs> if I want this to be a window behind them, then probably the pairs are darker in front of the window, so maybe I can start by showing one of these edges from the inside. So I'll go maybe here to here. And now I can actually show the edge between the pairs with a little bit of this too by coming around that corner. And then I'll just soften that edge a little bit. All right, let's look for another place. Well, if this is going to be a darker area behind the pairs, why not go ahead and make that darker now? I think I'll make that quite a bit darker. So I'm going to actually go over the entire windowsill right now. And I'll separate the windowsill from the background later. We do this a lot in watercolor where we lay one wash and then we make smaller washes on top of it to show where one thing ends and another one begins. All right. So now you can already start to see that pair emerge from the background. Let's work on this one. Let's make this pair a little different color. We'll make it more turquoise. So I told you these were going to be crazy pairs. Let's see. I think I will define this edge from here around to there. And maybe let's define, show where this edge separates from that background by painting the tabletop. And again, if it's more comfortable, I just turn it around. There's no reason to make things more awkward than they need to be. Let's maybe show where this pair separates from that pair by painting this, the lower shadow edge of that pair. And this is my turquoise pair, so I'm going to make that mostly turquoise with just a little bit of green in it. And again, it's easier for me to go this way. Well, I think I want that even darker. Well, that area is still wet, so I'm going to leave a little sliver in between, but if 
you get into a wet area and it starts to run, that's okay. We will have more opportunities to make distinctions between this edge and that edge later, so we're not going to worry too much about it. Let's see. How about I can show differences between edges also with a color change. So let's make this pair greener and do this area on this pair as well. See how I'm leaving, leaving that little sliver of white? I actually have a little bit of tabletop down here, but I'm going to go all the way down and we'll worry about separating that later. And I'll soften that edge. So I'm only thinking about little bits and pieces of the edges. I'm not thinking about painting objects yet. We'll worry about getting the objects more fully defined as we go, but for right now you can already start to see the pairs emerging. So you might like this really jazzy colors and you might decide that I'm going to add another color that's pretty similar to these colors. So I've got a yellow and an orange. So maybe something else that's over on that side of the color wheel, something that might range from, say, a yellow-green to perhaps I would add more of a reddish-orange or a red and keep it all, sort of all on one side of the color wheel. Or I could say I'm going to go across the color wheel and look for something that's complementary colors to this. So a complement of a yellow-orange would be a blue-violet. So I think I'm going to do that. I'm going to add a blue-violet. And I happen to have one on my palette already. This is ultramarine blue-violet. And don't feel like you have to use just a color that's already on your palette. You could mix it. Maybe I want it a little more towards the bluish shade. So I'll add a little turquoise to it. I still have a blue-violet, something that's sort of a complement. So what am I going to do with this? Well, I have some edges still to define and I have some areas that I need to pull together. And so I'm going to use this as another tool to help show the viewer where an edge exists. So, so far, we've shown the viewer that this is an edge by making this area darker than this area, or this area darker than this area. So we've used light and dark, which in painting is called value, to show where our edges are. And now we're going to continue with the light and dark, but we're also going to add some color variations. So, for example, I'm going to use my blue-violet on this entire back wall. I'm just going to glaze over it. And again, it's easier at this angle, so I'm going to turn it upside down. And this time, I'm going to do this entire area. Just paint right over everything I've already done right up to my little line that I wanted to have between my wall and my window or whatever it's going to turn out to be. So I'm just ignoring everything that's underneath there, going over all of it. I'm not trying to be super careful about getting things exactly lined up with previous things. So if I want to reshape my pair a little bit, I can do that at this point. And because all of this is sort of got this unifying color on it, your brain will say, oh, that must all go together. So when I get to this area where there's an area I've kind of painted over a previous line and reshaped it, because this is all one kind of color scheme, your brain puts it all together and it kind of ignores the fact that there's a little difference in this brush stroke from the previous brush stroke and it says I'm going to let the I'm going to listen to the blue and believe that that's all one piece. So now I've kind of unified that piece back there. Now, let's do something similar to the shadow side of our pair. One thing I want to do as I do this, though, is I don't want to lose all the cool stuff that's in here already. So if there's something that I like, like these speckles here, I'm going to let that wash show through. I don't want to cover up everything in the previous pass. 
So one trick to keep yourself from overworking is to tell yourself, I have to leave some of the previous stuff still visible. I can't cover up everything. Okay, so now what else do I feel like I need to kind of pull this together? Well, maybe some, the light's coming from over here. Maybe there's a shadow on the table over here. Now, I don't want to have the shadow go all the way back to the wall that's behind my table because maybe a little bit of light slip, slips in behind that pair. I don't have to be too worried about like making this pear-shaped shadow. <laughs> Let's just make it a shadow. And one thing about shadows is as they move away from the object especially, they have a tendency to become softer and more diffused. So I think I will soften these edges out here. You can do it with a brush like that or you can do it with a smudge with your finger. And that helps kind of let them blend into the background. Now let's see, what else do I think I want to do? I would like this edge to be defined a little better. But if I paint blue over all of this, then that kind of makes it match that. So what I'm going to do is, I'm still going to paint blue over it, but again it's going to be a very pale wash. And I'll start with a little more down here. And as I move up, I will rinse my brush and kind of dilute this so that it becomes paler farther up. So now there's a wash over this which helps to make it recede a little bit in the background and make the pair a little more prominent, but it's not too obvious. All right, coming back to this one, we need to add a little information here to help the viewers see where this pair is separated from the tabletop. And if you're having trouble kind of figuring out where you want to put your brush, at any point in a watercolor, you can pick your pencil up again and kind of redraw your guide marks. Let's see, let's keep this analogous. We'll keep using this same color on all three. I think this will work very well as our third color here. So we'll add this darker blue down here to show the difference between that pear and the tabletop. And then so that the tabletop all hangs together in the viewer's mind, We'll glaze over these areas with that same color. So what happens is, even though there are different colors underneath, again, because I am using this same color in all these areas, your eyes and your brain look at that and say, oh look, this connects to this, connects to this, it must all be the same surface. So we as artists use those little clues that our brain is using to make those distinctions to help the viewer make those distinctions as well. Right here I'm going to make a little shadow behind the window molding. some of our pairs. Let's define this edge that isn't really defined yet. And I'll just leave a little sliver of white there so that the pair doesn't run into the tabletop. So as I defined this new edge, you see how I ran over the previous one and over this previous one a little bit? And that kind of pulls it all together. Need to, hmm, yeah, I probably need to do something with this edge because the light's coming from over here, so that looks a little strange. And again, this is wet, so I'm going to leave a little sliver of white. And right here I still need a little help, but I don't want to make it just the same as that. So let's do that with um, the 
the turquoise. And that's kind of a nice little brush stroke, so maybe, especially down here, maybe I'll just leave that as it is and just drink up that little excess at the top. Let's give our pears some stems. I'm just going to go first. And kind of make a little dot there for the base of the stem. Little brush stroke and another little brush stroke. I don't have to go in there very carefully and completely make the shape of a pear stem because by this time the viewer is starting to figure out these are pears. I'd like this area to be a little darker so let's come in with more. Now I'm starting to try to create the shapes And I'm trying each time to sort of go a little past where I'm overlapping or not quite to the end of where I'm overlapping so that I'm not going over everything that I previously did. I'm leaving some of the previous wash showing through. Let's take some turquoise. Now this is dry here, so I'm going to do, again, a unifying wash. So something I want to have come together as one thing. So this is the windowsill and the wall. If I pull the same color over it, it starts to be red as the same thing. At this point, I like to look at it and say, all right, I can tell that these are pairs. It's not totally logical, and it doesn't need to be totally logical. So now I'm going to just start saying, where would I like a little bit of a different color? And I love turquoise, as you obviously know if you've been watching my videos. So I'm going to use some turquoise to make some little um, strokes, smaller strokes, that kind of do the job. For example, I had this white here and I don't really want white there. So I'm going to use turquoise to kind of cover that up and add a little interest to my pair at the same time. And I actually think I'd like it to extend up above instead of starting just below. And let's see, I think I will do the same thing here. So now I'm kind of adding turquoise here and there as accents and also at the same time sort of taking care of some of the distracting little bits of white that I had to leave because I didn't want things to run into other things. So this is another place where we've got that going on. So we will kill two birds with one stone, add an accent of turquoise and at the same time get rid of the distracting white that we don't want. Now sometimes the little whites are fine, like this little white here is almost like a little light wrapping around the pear, so I'll leave it. Oops, I didn't quite get all of this one. Let's get that done. And otherwise, I, I kind of like where it is, so I might not do any more. Or maybe, maybe I'll use this to make the little depression by the base of the stem. And that's probably enough. Now, I know right now this looks pretty messy because, as we've mentioned before, with all this tape around it, there's a lot of messy stuff around here, so don't evaluate your work with the tape on it. If you think it might be done, better to pull off the tape, and then if it isn't, put some more tape back on and work on it some more, than to fiddle with it and overwork it because you're actually being distracted by the mess around it and not the actual painting. See, once I pull the tape off, that's actually pretty nice. I kind of like those pairs, so I'm going to call those done and move on to the next one. All right, let's come back to this one now that it's dry, and we wanted to put a stem on our pear, and I think I'm going to take my bright orange and use that for my accent color here. So let's see what happens if I make my stem with a bright orange. So I'll have a little dot. This brush is a little bit too wet. And then I'll make a little brush stroke. <laughs> that's a pretty bad brush stroke, but that's okay. I think that'll work. 
And now I'm going to use the orange as my accent color, but I'm also going to look at some things like this pair looks a little pasted on, and part of the reason it looks pasted on is these edges are all uniformly hard. So over here on the shadow side, I'm going to add some color, but I'm going to deliberately kind of go over, too far over, <laughs> as if I were reshaping my pair, but really what I want to do is this is another way of making an edge a little softer, is to run over a previous edge but not quite right, not accurately. <laughs> so sometimes I'm going to be a little outside that edge, and then over here I'm going to be a little inside that edge. Let's see, let's do a little bit over here. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to actually um, run a little inside the edge. Well, let's start here. We'll run a little outside the edge. Then I'll run a little inside that edge. And I don't want this to read like a line, so I'm going to dry brush around the corner. And then up here I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to kind of accidentally on purpose not completely match up with my previous edge. And that helps give a sense of a softened, a slightly softened edge. Down here, this little sliver doesn't look quite right, so let's see. How about if we soften that, actually, actually soften that one. And then very often, the color of an object reflects into its shadow, so I'm going to continue this right on down into the shadow, and then soften that edge and kind of blur it out. So that sort of makes some of these edges a little lost, what we have, uh, we call lost and found edges, where you can't really tell exactly what the, where the edge is, and that happens in the real world, and so that actually is kind of a nice little naturalistic thing to do. Now, all of my accent color is on my pair, and I'd like to have a little accent color elsewhere, but I want it to be more subtle, just to kind of tie things together, so I think I'm going to put a little bit back here on the back part of the table and then just blend that out and I'll do the same thing on this part of the table. A little bit brighter orange back there and then let it blend and get paler to the front and then I think I'll put a little bit of accent orange back here somewhere. Just not for any logical reason, remember now, we're not being logical at this point, just because I want a little bit of that color somewhere back there. So maybe there's a little light reflecting. It does not have to make sense. Light bounces around in a scene, and so you can wind up with colors and lights and shadows all over the place in ways that don't make sense unless you know what's outside the scene, so I can do whatever I want there. I kind of think I want to stop at this point, pull the tape, and see what I think. So I kind of like that pair, and I think I'm going to stop at that point and not risk overworking it. Here's an example of one that I did come back to the next day, and I decided I wanted to do more with this accent color and make some patterns. Pattern is another way that I can show where one thing ends and another one begins. I have the same bright red in both places, but the pattern here ends at the pair. So even if you normally like to work in a more realistic fashion, this is a good way to practice some skills that you can use no matter what your style of painting is. Things like learning to separate an object from its surroundings by defining parts of the edges and not feeling like you have to paint one object and then another object. Learning how to pull an area together with a unifying wash or to give the viewer cues to connect separate areas into the same thing even though they are three disconnected pieces on this painting. Using brighter accent colors to pull things forward, using duller washes to kind of make things recede into the background so that your subject can stand out. So there's a lot to learn in this, and pairs may not be your favorite thing, but because the pair is such a simple shape, you can focus on the other skills that you're trying to learn here instead of getting too wrapped around the axle about whether you painted something right or not. 
So this is a great kind of exercise to do when you're tired and stressed. You still get a lot of learning out of it. It's low stakes. And when you're done, they're actually kind of fun pairs. And I think you could still um, have a good time sending these. Um, someone would be happy to have that and stick it in their kitchen on their refrigerator. So, And best part about the playful colors is you can choose colors that you know suit someone's decor. And because a pair is such a recognizable shape, it works just fine no matter what the colors are, even if they're crazy things like turquoise and purple. So I hope you have fun with this exercise, and I will see you next time. Happy painting!